All right. Whenever I was, I went to Angelo State University and at ASU, well, I went to ASU, I was enrolled at Angelo State University. <laughs> Let's try to be honest, I'm working on that part. Uh, I, I was enrolled at Angelo State University and uh, we had a little bitty tiny bedroom, uh, two bedroom apartment that nine guys lived in. And no, that's a, actually there was four of us. Um, no, actually there was six of us. I take that back. There was two of us in one bedroom, two of us in another bedroom, and the dining room had a shower curtain across the front of it, and two guys stayed in the dining room. He had bunk beds. One slept on the table, one slept underneath the table. It was a pretty good, pretty good deal. But one of my buddies, Jeffrey, had some pet snakes. Has anybody ever had a pet snake? They had... A couple of them, but the biggest one's name was Sheba, okay? And Sheba was a ball python, and I, I reckon she's about, you know, 92 feet long. No, she was only about four foot long, and she was kind of a sweet snake, and I kind of took a liking to her, mainly because we would go to Hastings. See, kids, back then, there wasn't DVDs. There was only these big old cassette tapes, and you had to go to Hastings or a movie rental location to rent them, and you had to rewind them, or you paid 50 cents. I remember the first time DVD came out, I tried to rewind that thing for three days. It wouldn't work. But we would go to Hastings because Hastings was right around the corner and we'd go to Hastings and sometimes I'd take that snake and I'd loop it over my neck and I'd go walking in. There was two reactions. Some of them was good, some of it wasn't. I stopped doing that because I figured out right quick that nobody, them girls didn't like it when you had a snake wrapped around your head. So I quit. But anyway, so we lived in this house, and they had this aquarium, and Sheba would be all curled up, and it was a, it was a sight. You know, everybody had to get up there and look at the snakes. Well, one morning, we got up, and we went in, and we fed them the, you know, like mice, right? You know, just throw, throw a little mouse in there, and, and it just, it, I don't understand how a woman can scream and be so scared of a mouse, but she don't want a snake to eat it. I ain't figured that out yet. That's one of them mysteries. But we went to Sheba, and Sheba was gone. Now, I kind of liked that snake when I knew where she was. We couldn't find that snake. And I tell you what, it was a little bit creepy when you would go to bed knowing that there was a four- to six-foot ball python running around in the apartment because she didn't go out the doggy door, I promise you. You kind of notice those things. Well, while I was at Angelo State University not attending classes, I was working for a feedlot. San Angelo Feeders out of Miles, Texas. And I had to be at work at like 5 o'clock in the morning, and so, you know, it was about a 30 or 40 minute drive, so I had to get up about 3.30. And I remember I walked in there, and I was a showering and everything. You got half eye closed, and the only reason you finish your shower is because the, the cold water wakes you up. You know, you're like, you're just kind of standing there. I don't know what it is. I can get up at 5 every day, of the, every day of the week and never blink twice. But if you start getting up before about 4, it just ruins my whole day. I don't like it. But anyway, so I'm sitting there and I shower and I get out of the shower and I still got one eye closed. That, that shower didn't do nothing about it. And I'm going to go brush my teeth and I open up that drawer and I projectile scoured that whole bathroom. Because that snake was in the bathroom drawer. And if you've never opened a bathroom drawer and had a four-foot python looking at you, you will never look at snakes the same way again. It was a horrible, horrible experience. I'm still not over it to this day. And that got to make me think, I got to thinking about some snakes. And, um, you know, y'all didn't laugh at that scare jokes like I thought you would. That went over... That went over about as well as a fart-flavored Pop-Tart. Y'all are tough today, I guarantee you. Where'd everybody go? Uh, anyway, I don't even know if I should continue now. I thought, I, was, I kind of started off with the good stuff, and it goes downhill from here. Good grief. But you know, I mean, you think about it, snakes have played a, 
A pretty vital, important, pretty vital, important, I think that's English, pretty vital, important uh, deal in Christianity. You know, you think about Adam and Eve, um, you know, that old snake, he, he talked old Eve into eating that apple, and before you fellas start blaming your wives, let me make one thing clear. After she took a bite, she handed it to Adam. Adam was standing right there. Okay? The snake might have tempted Eve, but oh, Adam, he was right there. So don't go to pointing fingers at your spouse or anything like that. But I'm here to tell you that if Adam would have been a cowboy, as soon as that snake opened up his mouth, he just said, What for? And cut its head off and cut its rattlers off and hung it in a tree so it'd rain. But that didn't happen. So anyway. But I promise you, we're going to talk about some snakes also. We're going to talk about two snakes that's killing the church. And I'm not talking about save the cowboy. I'm not talking about the, the first Presbyterian church, and I ain't talking about the first Baptist church of, of Simla, Texas, or Simla, Texas. <laughs> oh, why is that funny, Terry? <laughs> I ain't heard him laugh in three and a half years. I'd have used that joke a long time ago if I got a chuckle out of the brand inspector. <laughs> that was funny. Uh, I'm talking about the church as a whole. Because a lot of people think that the church is, is, you know, oh, we go to the church on Sunday. No, we are the church. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is the fellowship of believers. And there's a couple of snakes. Now, there, there's, there's a lot more than this, but we're only going to talk about two of them. There's a couple of snakes that's just wreaking havoc in the church. And like I said, I ain't talking about in a building on Sunday morning. I'm talking about Monday through Sunday out there in the real world when we ought to be doing things. The first snake, it's a biter. It'll reach out there and bite you. The first thing that this snake does is cause a thing called self-righteousness, and we'll talk about self-righteousness in a minute. But the second thing it does, the second thing it does is it causes big butts. Okay? Wow. I like big butts and I cannot lie. You other brothers can't deny. And when a girl walks in with an itty bitty waist and a round thing in your face, you get sprung. Wanna okay, that's enough. You know I bet y'all have never heard big butts at a church service before. Y'all didn't know I had moves like that, did you? If you could see my wife right now, she just left. <laughs> That'll probably be on YouTube. <laughs> He's the Antichrist. He played big butts. Good grief. All right. But it does. It makes big butts, and I will not lie. All you others can't deny but before I tell you what that snake is, I want you to understand something. This is serious. Most of the time, y'all are <laughs> bracing like this is going to be serious, but yeah, I'm serious. I want you to know something. Jesus did not come to this earth. God did not send his only begotten son to this earth to make bad men good. I want you to understand that. Some of you has heard it before, but I want that to sink in. Jesus did not come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men alive. Is anybody here today? He didn't come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men alive. You have to understand that if you're going to understand anything else I say today. Because the devil, that old snake, he's going to try to twist things and turn things and everything. But if you don't understand that Jesus did not come to make you a good person, he came to make you alive. Keep that in mind through this whole thing. This is why it's called the good news. He didn't come to make you good, he came to make you alive. This is why he's called our Savior. If we could be good enough, why would we need him, right? Think about that. Jesus came to do what we couldn't do. 
he fulfilled the law because the, the Jews, the Israelites, they thought they was all holy because they was God's kiddos, and they said, man, we can do whatever we want to. We're God's kids. And God's like, hang on, you ain't that holy. I'm going to give you the law because this. if you really wanted to be holy, if you want to cut... You want to get down to the nut cutting here. Here's what it takes to be good, and you can't do it. Proved it. But Jesus came, and he did it. Only God is holy. Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. You've got to know that. Jesus did not come so that you would have to obey a set of rules and be good. He came because you are dead in your transgressions, I am dead in my transgressions, and he came so that those sins would be forgiven so that we could be made alive. How do I know if I'm going the right way? How do, we, how do I know if I'm following the truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except to the Son. How do you know if you're on that right path? How do you know if what you're doing is the truth? How do you know if you are alive or dead, it's easier to spot than you can think. But the answer may scare some of you, or at least it should. The first snake that we're going to talk about, and we're probably going to talk about the second snake uh, next Sunday, so be, be sure and be here. But the first snake that I'm going to talk about, I've already alluded to it, is morality. What do I mean by Morality. Morality is right versus wrong. Mora another way to put it is morality is the discussion or the principles involved in good behavior or bad behavior. Morality. What is right? What is wrong? Good versus bad. Remember, Jesus didn't come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men alive. Morality poisons you with two things. What do you mean morality poisons? Aren't we supposed to have good morals? Aren't we supposed to have uh, upstanding moral character and everything like that? If we're supposed to have good morals, then why am I saying that morality poisons us? Because think about this. How do we know what is right versus wrong? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, is he not? But how many times do we try to make our kids good, upstanding, moral citizens that don't... Uh, don't do anything wrong. They don't break the law. We tell our kids, oh, you should be good. Why, Dad? Why should I be good? Because the Bible says so. No, because that's why Jesus called us to live. We can't be good without him, so why are we leaving him out of our morality issues? He is the way. He is the truth. You can't be good without Jesus, so why do we keep trying? Self-righteousness. In Luke chapter 18, if you got your Bibles, turn to Luke 18. If not, sit there and look at me and listen. What did I say? Okay. Luke 18. Once a religious leader asked Jesus this question. Good teacher. Can't you see this fella? <laughs> He's already a religious leader, so you can see the pomp and circumstance, right? Bet you a politician that claims he's a Christian, right? Good teacher, what must I do to inherit the eternal life? Is that what he says? Yeah. What should I do to inherit eternal life? <laughs> well, Jesus responds with a question, and he says, Why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. Now, wait a minute. Before I go on, this is kind of a side note, and I ain't going to chase this rabbit very far, but you have to know something right now. Jesus wasn't saying that he wasn't good. Jesus is God, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons in one God. Understand? Jesus is trying to get that guy to realize that guy was walking up to him thinking that he was just a teacher, that Jesus was just some teacher. Jesus knew the man wasn't looking for answers. He was looking for validation of his own thoughts and opinions. Ever had anybody come up and ask you a question, and they really don't care what you have to say? They just want you to back what they feel and think up? That's what this guy's doing. So he goes up to Jesus, and he says, Good teacher. And Jesus is like, Why do you call me good? Only God is good. He was trying to say, Look, man, before you go any further, you're talking to God. 
Okay, Keep that in mind. Jesus isn't saying that he isn't good. He's saying that he's the only one that's good, and he is God. Because this guy's coming up with a little bit of self-righteousness already. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? What must I do to inherit? Inherit. Is that a word? Inherit. Inherit. Eternal life. The guy was looking for validation of his own thoughts and opinions. Think about this. You know we have successfully created God in our own image when God thinks, acts, wants, and agrees with the same things we do. You ever seen somebody like that? They know exactly what God thinks, feels, acts, and knows about everything. They have successfully created God in their own image. And that's a false idol. Okay, we're done with that. Jesus, and then, because <laughs> Jesus is cool, Jesus says, but to answer your question, okay, he kind of tries to set the tone. He tries to get this feller straightened out. I mean, this guy, he, he already is coming at Jesus' jihad. Jesus is trying to line him out. So Jesus says, but to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely and honor your father and mother. That's what Jesus said. Now remember, some of you is saying, well, I ain't never committed adultery. I ain't never murdered nobody. I ain't never stole nothing. I ain't never falsely testified against anybody. I love my mom and daddy. Remember, Jesus said, if you look at another man or woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. When you lie about anybody, when you gossip, you have done false testimony. Jesus says all that because we can't... The man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Wow, that guy's already, he don't even need Jesus, does he? He right there with one foot in heaven's door, isn't he? Here is the good Christian. Has anybody ever heard that term? Good Christian. Oh, I'm a good Christian, or oh, he's such a good Christian, or she's such a good Christian. There ain't no stinking thing as a good Christian, okay? Because if there was a good Christian, that means that there would have to be a bad Christian, right? And there are no good Christians, there are no bad Christians, there's only saved Christians, right? Make sense? Can't be good enough. So why are you calling them good Christians? But here is the quote-unquote good Christian in all of his glory. He is puffed up with pride, goodness gracious, and he, he is knocking on the pearly gate, demanding entrance for every, all the good that he has done. And how good he is. He, he is double-jointed in his shoulders from patting himself on the back because he has done so many great things. He's like, God, just open up the gates. Give me the keys because I am so holy. Oh, my gosh. That's what morality will do. You can't be good enough to inherit the kingdom of God. Only by Jesus living through can you be good enough. Since he is a good Christian... He has the right to tell everyone else what they are doing wrong. You ever seen a good Christian that does that? Boy, they just come up and all that. I mean, they got holiness just dripping off of them. And boy, brother, you just need to stop doing this, and sister, you need to stop doing that. And that. They're just self-righteousness makes me want to puke. And I ain't talking about that we can't lift a brother up and everything, but you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the holier than thou's, you know? Those that just, you know, he just stank with self-righteousness. That's what morality will do. And that's what this religious leader is doing with Jesus. He's like, man, I've done all of that. Look at me. Look at how good I am. Those people can say anything to anyone. <laughs> you know, uh, sorry, honey, I didn't clear this with you, so I'll just beg forgiveness instead of asking permission. But, you know, my wife has a has a fan page on Facebook called The Worst Preacher's Wife Ever. And uh, if, you're, if you're a self-righteous hypocrite, don't go there because she will she'll smack you with a two-by-four. But all she put on her Facebook fan page is, whatever happened if you ain't got nothing nice to say, just don't say it at all. You ever wondered that? Well, I mean, do you remember hearing that as a kid? I mean, gosh, I remember hearing it when I was a kid a couple of years ago. 
If you ain't got nothing nice to say, just don't say anything at all. That's all she put on Facebook. If you ain't got nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. And this guy, he put on there, well, do you do that, preacher's wife? And she was like, thank you for pointing that out exactly. And then he goes off on her, and I don't remember what he said because I was going to track this feller down and beat the snot out of him because you don't talk to my wife like that. But he ended it with, in Jesus' name. Man, I kicked the snot out of him from here to Simla, Texas. If I get a hold of him. And once I was done, I'd tell him that was in Jesus' name for using the Lord's name in vain. But, it, you know, those self-righteous people, they do that. Boy, they can just walk around all prideful and I can do and say whatever I want to because I'm so holy and I'm so good. It ain't nothing but self-righteousness. And that's what morality will lead to, self-righteousness. There is no such thing as a good Christian. Erase that from your vocabulary. Vocabulary, however you say that. Delete it. Rewind it. Throw it out. Feed it to the snake. I don't care. Get rid of thinking that there are good Christians. There's not. The second thing, that was the first thing of the bite and snake of morality. And the second thing is this. Excuse makers. In other words, those with big butts. They got a butt for everything. Now, I'm probably going to step on a few toes and if you would like to, you come up after the service, if you dare, and I'll take my sock off and I'll show you my bruised toes. Because I've been, they've been stepped on with me also. So before you go getting offended about what I'm fixing to say, you just know that I've been there and I'm limping around too. Anybody ever heard a Christian say, oh, my life verse is this. It's this real neat Christian, it's a good Christian thing to do to have a life verse. And so it's the verse that just explains everything about your life, and it just touches me and all this stuff. So here, here's, here's the big butts. Here's their life verse. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Think about this. How many times have you heard a professed believer in Jesus Christ justify their actions by saying, well, nobody's perfect, everybody's a sinner. How many times have I said that? I've said that before, folks. Unfortunately, I, may I beg your forgiveness and God's also for ever mentioning those words. Well, I can do whatever I want to because I'll never be perfect and I know I won't be perfect for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I can just do whatever the heck I want to do and everything's going to be just fine. Let me give you a new life verse there, Joe Boo. That was a major league reference in case y'all didn't catch that. It wasn't in the notes either. Galatians 6, 7, 8, 9. This is for those people that use, well, I know I ain't perfect, so I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing and Jesus is going to forgive me because I can do whatever I want as long as I go to church on Sunday. I'll go to church and get all holied up. Maybe it'll last till next Sunday. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Careful. You don't have the right to tell me what to do because you ain't perfect either. Ain't nobody perfect. Well, I ain't trying to tell you what to do, fella. I'm trying to keep you from backing up into that fire right there, you dummy. I can continue to do what I want to do however I want to do it because Jesus died on the cross to forgive me of my sins. Let me give you a new life verse. I'm going to tell you an easy way to remember this. 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay? 6, 7, 8, 9. Galatians 6, 7, 8, 9 says this. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. See, morality does two things. If we focus on morality, and what I mean by morality is good behavior... 
then if we actually accomplish that, then it leads to self-righteousness. We think that we have done something, and we start patting ourselves on the back. Remember, Jesus did not come here to make bad men good. He came to make dead men alive. But on the flip side of that coin, some people know they ain't going to be good. They ain't even going to try it, so they're going to try to justify their sinful ways by saying, well, I'll have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and I can do whatever I want to. I can continue to run around and sleep around and do this and do that. I don't care. Man, I, I can continue to eat 14 pans of brownies a week or, you know, be addicted to Dr. Pepper's. Whatever the case may be. Ain't none of us free from it. But which side are you on? Because that's what happens when we try, when we try to be good. When we try to live good, moral lives. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Galatians 6, 7, 8, and 9. A man reaps what he sows. Whatever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let those who have ears hear. Got it? So we can't be good enough. But we should strive to be good. Is That's what Jesus is basically saying. We can't ever be good enough, but we should strive to be good. Isn't that a little confusing? No, not really. My buddy Ty just got back from the Buck Branham and Pro-Am Roping in Santa Inez, Guadalajara, Taco Burrito, California. I don't know, something like that, right? I think they just call it Santa Inez for, it's close. He went to the Buck Branham and Pro-Am. And the way they do that, I love to hear the story, and you ought to get tired to tell it, is there's, there's a pro, there's two guys that stink. No, not really. I was joking, Ty. Ty won that deal yesterday, so he doesn't stink. So uh, You can win it when there's no money on the line, right? <laughs> but there's two guys that are considered amateurs, I guess, and then there's one pro that Buck Branneman chose. And Ty and them got this guy that was just sure enough, I mean, yeah, he throws a loop, it's there. So they, so they ride in, and the pro says, what do y'all want to do, guys? And Ty said, well, I'd like to have the first loop. He said, the way I look at it is, I came here to rope. I'm paying to rope at this place, so I'd like to have the first loop, and if I miss, could you come in and get it for me? He said, absolutely. And that's exactly what their pro did. Their pro stood back and waited on those guys and encouraged them and offered tips. Hey, man, you know, do this. Get ready. That one's coming around like this. And, and boy, Ty and, and Sean, they're listening to their pro and everything. And, and their pro, you know, sometimes their pro didn't even have to do nothing but get off and just put the deals on there to, to end out, do the groundwork. And then other times, one of them fellas might have missed and their pro came in there just like nothing. Let's go, boys. We got her. Everybody's got a part to play. That's the way our Christian lives should be. We are in a pro-am roping with Jesus, and he's our pro. We should take the first loop. We should try to be good. But you know what? If we mess up, Jesus comes in there, and he swoops us up, and he helps us out. I ain't got no better illustration to tell y'all of how you should Live your lives better than that. We should never just go into our roping and just chunk the loop on the ground because we're afraid that we can't be good enough or we can't catch. Jesus said, never tire of doing good. We ought to swing hard and swing fast. And you know what? It ta There's going to be a lot of misses before you catch. Does that mean you quit trying? No. Jesus is there, man, and he knows that if you're trying, he's going to come in there and that fella don't miss. He ain't never missed. It's what made him perfect. And the longer you go on and the more you start listening to him, the better you'll be. And the better your life will be. You're not good enough, but man, when Jesus is backing you up, he's good through you. He makes you better. Not because of who you are, but because of who he is. Remember those questions that I asked at the beginning? How do you know if you're going the right way? How do we know the truth? 
How do we know? Let me ask you a more pointed question. How do you know if you're alive or dead? Do you know the answer to that? How do you know? Are you sure? In other words, I'm asking, are you saved? How do you know? How do you know? It's easier to spot than you think. True belief, true Christianity, true faith, true entrance to eternal life is all marked by one thing. And it's found in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you're riding with him in this pro-am that we call life, if you are entered up into eternity, if your entry fees have been paid, here's the answer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. I know a lot of people that claim they believe in Jesus Christ. They claim that Jesus is their Lord and Savior, and there ain't no transformation in their life whatsoever. But I can tell you this, I know a few guys that if you'd have known them back then and you know them today, they're two totally different people. They are new creations. I am so thankful to my Lord and Savior that I am a new creation. If you'd have known me 10 years ago, I had a beer in each hand, a lie on my lips, Man, I'd chase you, fight you, talk bad about you behind your back, lie, cheat, steal. I was as low a fella as ever could be. And then Jesus jerked a knot in my soul's tail and said, come on and ride for me. And I fought him for a long time. Have you been transformed? Or is the only thing different about your Christian life where you go on Sunday mornings? Ain't nothing else has changed. I just go to church on Sunday. Make no mistake about it. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. Have you been transformed? There's your answer to your question. Have you been transformed? Are you a new creation? And how do you be transformed? Look back to Luke 18, where Jesus is talking to that religious fella, the one that's so busy patting himself on the back. And Jesus ends his talk with that guy with the answer of how you can be transformed. When Jesus heard his answer, he said this right here, there is still one thing that you haven't done, Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Now, I want you just to put that in your back pocket. I ain't telling you right now that you've got to sell your house and give all your money to the poor or anything like that because it's the next deal that matters. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, always pay attention if Jesus Christ says then. This is what he says. Then come and follow me. It really is as simple as that. Then come and follow me. You following Jesus? Or you just wave at him when you see him when you're in town? Or do you just kind of happen to maybe catch a glimpse of him here and there and, hey, what up, Jesus? What up, JC? Is that, is that your relationship with Jesus? Or do you follow him? Do you ride with him? You and Jesus pards? Or you just have kind of a working knowledge of maybe who he is? Kind of like Buck Brandon. Ah, oh, I seen him on TV, so I know him. I know what he looks like and everything. Don't mean you're pards with him. Don't mean that you're following him either. You know, George and Vonda. George told a fella, George and Vonda are our missionaries, and I call them our missionaries because I'm plumb proud of them, not because of what but what Jesus Christ is doing through him down in Guatemala. But this fellow asked George, he said, 
How did you make it down to Guatemala? He said, well, I sold everything I had. I gathered up my kiddos and my wife. We sold everything we had. Just what Jesus said right there. He said, we sold everything we had, and we moved down to give it to the poor. And that fellow said, man, that's extreme Christianity, isn't it? George said, no, it's just real Christianity. There's no such thing as extreme Christianity. You need to do what Jesus Christ tells you to do. I ain't up here to tell you how to live your life or what to do. That's Jesus' job, and your job is to follow him. Are you willing to do that, or would you just rather watch him on a DVD? I watch saved. Are you not? You a new creation? Has the old gone and the new has taken its place? I was out digging a post hole. I was out digging a post hole in Kinosa, Texas. Sweat just running off of me, and then I started. <laughs> that was funny. I'm going to have to get a, there's a joke coming. Okay, so I was digging this post hole, right? Digging this post hole, and I mean, it's like digging through this concrete. Dink, dink, nothing happening, dink. So I leaned on the post hole diggers like this, leaned on my PhD. See, y'all ain't the only ones with PhDs. I got a PhD too. Leaned on them PhD, and I looked over, and there's my little girl. Love my little girl. She walking through the pasture. She's strolling through there. My heart's filled up with love. Look at my little girl. She's over there. And I saw the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. I literally watched my daughter go, and a rattlesnake strike right at her knee. She nearly stepped right on it. She put her foot right here and then lifted her foot off, and the snake struck at her. My knees went absolutely weak. Just, ah. That snake died the most horrible, God-forsaken death. He, he, was, he was plumb miserable by the time it was over with. He had accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior by the time I got done with him. We had the biggest, largest come-to-Jesus meeting that ever. There was a tent revival. But you know what? I want you to come back next week or tune in. If you're listening on the radio or watching on the Internet, I want you to come back next week. Because I told you there was two snakes, and we talked about the first one, morality. We can't be good enough. Only by following Jesus Christ and allowing Jesus Christ to live through us can we be good enough. And Jesus, when we get up to the pearly gates, God looks at us and he doesn't see us. He sees our son living in us and he says, come on in, son. That's how we get in there. Not by anything that we do, but by what we allow Jesus to do through us. But I want you to come back next week and see how the snake called the American dream as we know it today, is squeezing the life out of us. And we're feeding our kids to it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, I thank you for your message today. As hard as it is, God, just give us the guts to be cowboys and cowgirls, to sign up in this pro-am that's called life, and, and just to ride with you and learn from you. And God, sometimes it's hard to hear what you say, but God, if we just go in there and do what you would do, do things the way we learn by praying and reading the Bible and by our, by, our, by our brothers and sisters, what we learn from them and the mistakes they've made and the integrity that they have of the people that we hang around. God, let us learn from all of those things so that we can do good things, not because of what we do, but being that conduit through which your love flows. God, you, you brought in a lot of people today, and God, there ain't a person sitting here or listening on the radio or listening on the internet that you ain't talking to right now God give them the guts to throw off them old leggings of sin and put on a fresh pair saddle up tow that stirrup and start riding for you because God if we know one thing there ain't no sissies in heaven and God, we thank you for the ones that are going to be there. And the ones that are going to be there, it's our job to go gather the ones that are lost. God, we need your help to do that. In your name I pray, amen.